Good evening. Thanks you for joining me this evening, both here in the library and virtually. My name is Marlis Lean. I am the adult programming librarian for Council Bluffs Public Library. We want to welcome Earl Hallberg this evening to our library, finally. He was originally scheduled to share some of his master gardening tips with us last April. Yes, just as our COVID shutdown hit, we are so happy to be able to have him speak with us this evening. At the end of the season, it's always a good time to nourish and winterize your garden. As I was working in my garden Sunday afternoon, I was thinking about what I might learn and apply to my garden this fall tonight. I have a blend of vegetable areas and flower areas, as well as bushes that are way out of control. Earl will take comments and questions after his presentation. So if you have any, please bring them to us here in the room or in the chat box or the Q&A. And now I'm gonna turn fall guard, it's fall gardening time over to Earl. Thank you. I was sitting this afternoon sitting outside and uh, reading a book, which I do a lot. And I'm sitting there in shorts and a t-shirt, reading a book and starting to sweat thinking, okay, in a few hours, I'm giving a talk on fall gardening. What is wrong with this picture? But anyway, uh, it is that time of the year or getting close. Actually, we are officially in fall. And so what we're going to do for a while is we're going to discuss maybe some of the things you can plant in the fall, which some of the things we put in the ground and that. We're going to talk a little bit about getting ready for winter, even though it's 90 some degrees today, winter is coming. And if I remember right, the Farmer's Almanac was predicting a colder than normal winter for this year. We'll see. And we'll spend a little time talking about what else is going on in the garden. Uh, part of my background was uh, I was a technical director for a pest management company for 42 years. And so that was on the commercial side of pest management. And so I spent a lot of time on that, identifying insects and that. And so we're going to touch a little bit about things that happen in the fall, both in the garden and around your house. In the fall, the first thing we think of when it comes time to plant, or at least most people, are bulbs of some kind. Tulips, daffodils, hyacinths, grape hyacinths, crocus, Grecian windflowers. And here's one of the reasons. Tulips come now and are wide range of colors. They come in a wide range of shapes. Some have fringed petals. You have the parrot tulips, which almost can look like an orchid, depending on, on the species. Uh, and so, and it's nice to see a tulip in the spring. Daffodils have gotten to be the same way. I remember when I was a, a kid, daffodils, they were always yellow. Now they're green, they're white. Uh, some are doubles, the, the trumpet in the middle. You can't see the center because of all the petals that are in there. And some of them, instead of one flower on the stock, there's multiple flowers on the stock. And there's hyacinths. This one happens to be in a container. A lot of people grow hyacinths in containers, but you can plant them in the ground. And again, the shape of hyacinths really haven't changed, but there's a myriad of colors that hyacinths come in. Here's our familiar tulip bulb, okay? You buy them, this is what it's gonna look like. So what do I do with it? Well, here's a close-up of a tulip bulb. And what you see there is where that little green thing is coming out the top, that's the growing end of a tulip bulb, or it's the pointed end, remember that. The bottom end is the flat end, and that's where the roots are going to come out. Here we see daffodils or narcissus, same thing. A little different shape, but again, it's, it's the pointed end. That's the growing tip. On the bottom is where the roots are going to come out. 
Notice too, these, these have kind of a papery film on the outside of them. It is suggested and I would advise you when, when you plant these, leave that on the bulb. It protects the bulb. And here we see uh, hyacinth bulbs, okay? Mm -hmm. and these things are pretty, pretty good size around, maybe two inches in that. So what am I, what am I supposed to do this? Yeah. Tulip, most bulbs, tulips, daffodils, hyacinths, plant them as soon as the ground cools, which it hasn't yet, okay? The last couple of days, still not helping the situation any either. And this usually occurs, if you'll notice, when evening temperatures average about 40 or 50 degrees. We've had maybe four or five of those where it's gotten down. I, you probably kind of want to end when it's got down in the 40s. Anyway, it's about six to eight weeks before the ground freezes, not the frost, not a first frost, that's before the ground freezes. That will not be till sometime late November, early December in this part of the country, unless something really drastic happens, which the way the weather patterns have been, I wouldn't bet on anything, but you got a while yet before you put them in the ground. The reason you want the ground to be cool is you don't want that bulb to sprout till next spring. What you want it to do is start setting roots down. So here we see a tulip bulb planted. Dig a hole in the ground, put the bulb in. Again, make sure that the pointed end is standing up, which I keep repeating that because I have known some people whose tulips didn't come up and they talked to me and said, I don't know what I did wrong. Yeah, they planted them upside down. And I told them, I said, well, they won't see what happened. Yeah, sure enough, they planted them upside down. They did start to sprout though. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough reserve energy there for that thing to totally turn 180 degrees and grow. You wanna plant them about two or three times the height of the bulb, which in the case of tulips, daffodils, and hyacinths, full-size ones, about six inches. Now this is measured not from the bottom of the bulb, but from the shoulder part of the bulb. In other words, when the bulb widens out, go about two to three times. So the average bulb is like say a tulip is about two inches. Okay, so you're gonna plant it about six inches. If you go four inches, is that gonna hurt anything? No, you go eight inches, it just may be slower coming up, okay. But six inches is a nice, usually even number that people can remember. And you wanna put them about three, six inches apart. And here we can see, you know, where somebody's planting them on the ground, this is about, about three inches apart. I would suggest you plant tulips, hyacinths, daffodils, all your bulbs, plant them in clusters. Don't make a row of soldiers in your yard, okay? In other words, one row of tulip bulbs. Just doesn't aesthetically look that neat, okay? Now you can plant them in a row, there's nothing wrong with that, but put them in a cluster like we see here with tulips. You can see, okay, there's a row of like three, but plant a cluster of them. You want that wow effect with tulips. Also remember when you go to buy tulip bulbs, look to see when they're made or designed or created to bloom. You have early bulbs, late mid season and late flowering. What I usually suggest to people, unless you want just one specific color, like you want all red or all yellow, uh, get a little bit of each one. This extends your, your, your blooming season out over two months, sometimes almost three months. You'll have tulips, different ones, but you'll always have, have tulips in your yard. Here we see daffodils planted in a cluster. Here's a different way to plant in a cluster. And I like this. They planted tulips and daffodils together. You know, so there's two different kinds of daffodils, a couple different colors of tulips. This is a great way to plant and it really gives a nice visual effect. But now you look at that and you think, somebody spent a lot of time on their hands and knees, okay? <laughs> what, what I suggest you do is this, if it's a brand new bed, you're going to start make a brand new bed, dig it down six inches, the whole bed. 
pile the dirt up on the tarp or something, then go in, set the bulbs down, then come in and cover it up with dirt. And you can plant like 50 bulbs or more in less than a half an hour. Or you can do it the, the other way. You can plant one at a time. But with a new bed, it's much easier to dig the hole and put them in and go for it. This is one of my favorite spring flowering plants. These are grape hyacinths. About six inches tall is all they are. And here we see them planted in, in right next to daffodils. <clears throat> Excuse me. The grape hyacinths are the bulbs on the left. Notice they're smaller. So because they're smaller, they're not planted as deep as, as the uh, tool, uh, tulip bulbs are. Excuse me, those are tulips, not hyacinths. Interesting thing about grape hyacinths, if you would come to my house right now, they're growing. And this is very common with grape hyacinths. They bloom in the spring, they come up in the spring and flower. But they'll also come up in the fall. They don't flower, they just send up leaves. And that's perfectly normal for grape hyacinths. And the nice thing about that, this allows the bulb to get a little extra energy to get it through winter for next spring for flowering. So we're out in the part of the bed where we have our grape hyacinths, they're up now probably oh, about three inches, the leaves are, it's kind of cool. When I first, when that first happened, I thought, okay, what did I do wrong? But uh, everything is right, you know, and like I said, what it does, it basically allows the bulb to collect more, you know, energy. Here's another spring flowering bulb that a lot of people like. These are crocus. And this is a process called naturalizing. And the way you do that, and crocus are sometimes a good thing to do this with. You can do it in your front yard. You take a handful of crocus bulbs, turn your back on the yard and throw them over your shoulder. Wherever they light, that's where you plant it. The crocus, the unique thing about them is these things will bloom when there's still snow on the ground. They'll come up through the snow and you'll have flowers blooming. And it's really kind of neat in the spring. You got, you know, an inch, two inches of snow on the ground and all of a sudden here's these, you know, bright blue or bright yellow little flowers blooming. And this is, the reason I say it's good to do with these, the grass has not come up yet. So you don't have to worry about mowing down your crocus because it'll be two or three months before you start mowing because these are gonna come up probably February, very early March, crocus will. Here's what the bulbs are. They're small, kind of like your uh, grape hyacinth bulbs. This is another one of my favorite spring bulbs. It's a little odd. These are called Grecian windflowers. They make a real pretty ground cover, uh, say in a bed of tulips or something like that. And this is what they look like. But here's the unique thing about it. This is what their bulb looks like. A rock. Yeah, it looks like a rock. And if you look, it, it's written on there top, bottom, okay? You can't always tell the top from the bottom with Grecian wood flowers. So what do I do? Plant it sideways. It'll grow just fine that way. Okay, and it'll come up just fine. It's better than planting it upside down. Okay, if you don't know. But if you notice it is curved a little bit more on the top, but it's, I, I planted uh, Grecian windflowers. I really like them. And it's, it's tough to tell sometime on the bulb. So the one, if I don't know what it is, I just turn sideways and Plop it in the ground. A lot of these bulbs will come up every year. Okay, daffodils come up, tulips and that. Unfortunately, now with hybridizing, there's a problem with tulips. If you ever go to a nursery now, now I mean, not excuse me, not a nursery, a botanical garden in the spring, late spring, they're out there digging up all their tulips. You think, why are they? Do Some of them just compost the bulbs. Now I do know Wichita's Botanical Garden, you can buy those two, those tulip bulbs for a quarter a piece and they dig them up. Uh, last I knew Lawrence and Gardens compost theirs. The reason they do this is hybridized tulips 
Look real pretty the first year. Pretty good second year. And then they're just about, they're basically done. There is one group of tulips, they're called Darwin tulips. These seem to hold for a few years and, and look decent. But the other ones you can just about bank on maybe two years and you're gonna have to plant, you know, if you want a tulip bed and you want to really get that wow factor like you see in the botanical garden, you're gonna to have to, you're almost gonna to have to plant every year or every other year. What other flowers do we do in the fall? Iris, I've started messing with, I shouldn't say messing, working with ours now. You should buy them in the spring. This is the iris, this is the rhizome. You can see the leaves have been cut off. It's not a bulb. In the way it's it's important how you plant iris much more so than tulips. Like I said, two about six inches. Okay, you get a four, it's no big deal. You get seven, it's no big deal. Iris, it's very important about its planting depth. So you want to dig a shallow hole. You know, in the first one it says build up a small mound in the soil in the center of the hole, and take the rhizome, center it over this ridge, and spread the roots out on either side then put the dirt back over it. Being careful not to bury that rhizome very deep. If you do, it will grow, but it will never flower. So you can see on the picture here, it's just right at the surface. <coughs> In fact, you go to some places and you can actually see the rhizome from the top. And that's not a problem. That's how most of my iris are. And I love iris. That's probably my favorite flower. It was my dad's favorite flower. And so we have a big iris bed. You can see almost all the rhizomes. But you get much over quarter, half inch of dirt on that rhizome, and it's never going to bloom. It'll grow, but it'll never set flower. You want to space plants about 12 inches apart. <coughs> Excuse me. If you notice the leaves are at one end, that's the growing end of the rhizome. The other end is what, I don't want to call it the dead end, but it's, it grows towards the leaves. And so as, as the rhizome gets bigger and bigger, that's the direction it's going to grow. So if you're going to plant these in a group, just remember that, that where the leaves, you want to point the leaves away from the other ones. You don't want them growing towards each other. Again, bury the rhizome. I say they're an inch or less. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't put over half inches. I wouldn't even do that much. I just sprinkle a little bit on top and leave it. In fact, last year, I had, to, <laughs> I had two that didn't bloom. So I'm out there on my hands and knees trying to remember which one didn't bloom. And sure enough, I couldn't find the rhizome, so I dug the dirt away and hopefully next spring they'll bloom. After you get them planted, make sure you water them. Okay, and, you know, water the ground. Now it's very important with tulips, anything you're planting now, if you haven't worked in your garden yet this year, it's like digging concrete. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, the ground has really gotten hard. You know, we were ahead of the head of the moisture game. We're now behind the moisture game. And so these things, <clears throat> again, because you're just planting them, you, you've got to keep those roots moist. If they dry out, you know, you're in trouble. This isn't a bad time to transplant iris either. You can dig them up, cut the tops off because I'm getting ready to transplant some of mine. Look at the rhizome, make sure it's healthy. If part of it looks like it's mushy or something like that, just cut it off or just throw it away, either or. I usually, in my case, just throw them away because iris, they expand a lot, okay? They will stay in a place for years in bloom. You can tell when it's time to divide them is when the, the blossoms start slowing down. You don't quite get as much this year as you did last year. Okay, now's the time to go out and it's time to, to split your, your iris. And you're gonna have more than you need, so give them to your neighbors, your kids. <laughs> Take them to a plant sale like Master Gardener has, whatever. So how do we plant these things? This is, 
This is the old ball planter, the tube one. Now this is one of the newer, fancier ones. If you look at it real close, if you look at the handle, it's in two parts. The reason being is after you core this down in the ground and pull up this plug of dirt, squeeze the handle together and the dirt falls out. Now your older ones weren't like that. They were just a solid tube and so then you had to pull the dirt out. All of these will have markings on the side. Usually the deepest, the top of it's about six inches. But there'll be a mark for like one inch, two inch, three inch. So you plan on several different things. Here's a better one to me, especially uh, the ground is getting harder for me and much farther down than it used to be. So I try to do as much as I can standing up. And this is what this one's made for, but a word of caution. Speaking from experience, I bought one, something like this one year. About this time of year, I went to use it and the ground was hard and being male, a lot of better term, grabbed that handle, jumped on that thing on both sides. The next thing I'm doing, I'm looking at the sky <laughs> and the handle bent in half. So make sure if you get one like this, that it's got a good sturdy handle. In fact, when you go to plant bulbs in that, what I would suggest you do, if you're making a circle, I turn the sprinkler on today, if I'm gonna to plant tomorrow. Get, get some moisture in that ground because it makes it a whole lot easier to dig. This is a dribble, okay? It's not made for killing people. It's made for planting bulbs. It'd be really slick for like the meat grape hyacinth, some of your smaller bulbs. I don't know how well it would work with tools, but that's one of the things that's out there. And there is my favorite. This is the kind that hooks on a drill. Now, mine is about three foot long and you can buy them that way. And it hooks into an electric drill so I can stand up and I can punch a lot of holes in the ground with that thing. And uh, the only thing is I would advise you if you use the electric, one of these screw auger and you're close to a tree, hang on to that drill because if that auger hits a, a tree root, it's liable to lock, but the drill won't lock, it just, and it won't throw you around, but it can hurt. Okay, so be, be a little careful when, when you're doing that. Also, they talk about knowing what's in the ground. You know, if you don't know where electrical stuff is or there's electrical wire or something, be a little careful. Oh, also, if you have an in-ground irrigation system, make sure you remember where it's at. Because that will go right through that PVC pipe. Another way is just a plain old garden trowel. Just plain old shovel. These are marked with, with inches and you can, you can plant with those. The nice thing back up a minute about the drill, if you're, you've had a bed now and, and you need to redo the tulips and that, you don't want to dig up probably the whole bed. That screw auger, you can, you can go into there and then in, in between like the daffodils or, or this tulip did really good this year, but the one next to it wasn't so great. So you want to put one in between, the screw auger is really nice. I mean, and they're not that expensive. They're relatively cheap. Uh, any garden store, hardware store like Menards, those places, they all carry them. One of the things you will learn if you plant bulbs is that there are some four-footed things out there that like bulbs. And these are squirrels and rabbits. Okay, and mice sometimes will dig up the bulbs. Now the squirrel, I can't decide whether he's digging it up to eat my tulip bulb or he's digging it up so he can plant a nut. I haven't quite figured out which one it is, but either way, he digs that bulb up and if I don't find it for a day or two, it's history. This is, a, it's called a bulb basket. You dig a hole about six inches deep. You put the basket in, put dirt in the bottom of it. It's, the bottom kind of looks like the lid there. It's got holes, put the, put the bulbs in, cover them up with dirt, snap the lid on, cover the whole thing up. And the tulips will grow up through those holes. Okay. But if a, if a squirrel goes to dig in there, it can't get to the bulbs. It's really kind of slick. Me being somewhat more economical, I use chicken wire and I just unroll it. And the, they're called uh, landscape staples. At my house, the wire coat hangers that I've cut the ends off of, because they're a whole lot cheaper. 
And if you can find wire coat hangers anymore, cover them about six inches long, six, eight inches long, push it down on the ground. After you get your bed all done, just put the chicken wire over it and you can just leave it. Yeah, it'll eventually rust through. After about the first year in a bed, squirrels don't seem to bother it. And, and mice don't seem to dig into it that. But that first year, and it's maybe because we're disturbing the dirt. So the squirrel thinks there's something down there it needs, or the rabbit thinks there's something down there it wants. But I just use chicken wire. It, it's cheap, it's economical, it's easy to put down. While you're out in the flower bed or the other flower beds, after you get done planting, now you have to go to the ones that you've got to unplant. And we do have some. Now this, this is kind of a personal thing with people. I know some people I have told, well, you buy gladiolas, you got to dig them up. He says, no, you don't. They sell them again next year. But if you want to keep from year to year, tender bulbs or rhizomes such as cannas, gladiolas, dahlias, you have to dig them up. They will not survive the winter 99% of the time. I have had cannas that made it through a winter. I have no idea how it did it, but it was only one. And it only happened once. So these have to be dug up if you want to keep them. Now, you don't have to dig them up. You could just buy new ones, I suppose, every year. But me being somewhat frugal or cheap, as my wife says, we dig ours up. Here's what cannons look like when you, when you go to dig them up. These, these are the rhizomes, very tender, and, and they're big. There's a gladiola corm. It's not a bulb. It's called a corm. And if you notice, there's those little white things. Those are insects or whatever. Those are actually bulbs, bulblets, that will produce at the bottom of the corm. If you're of the nature, you can take those, supposedly, I've never tried it, pick those off, put them in soil, and grow them. Now, they won't flower for a number of years, but supposedly you can do that in these are dahlias. These are the tubers of dahlias. So what are we going to do? Let's look at gladiolas first. Dig them when the foliage dies back, which has probably happened now or happening now. This has been a weird year. Okay, like I said, we're talking about fall gardening and it's 97 degrees outside. Stuff is dying rapidly outside because it's 90 degrees, but it's only like 30% humidity. Everything's drying out, if, if you'll notice, real bad. But once that fully time gladiola dies down, it, it, a lot of times they'll do it before frost. That's when you can go ahead and start to dig it. Dig, dig up the corms, gently shake the dirt off. Don't you know, rattle it like a baby rattle. Gently shake the dirt off of them. Cut the foliage back to about one or two inches. And dry them for about two to three weeks in a warm, dry, well-ventilated space. And that last thing is very important. Gladiola corms and, and all of these tender bulbs and rhizomes in that, they've got a lot of moisture in them. And so they'll, they'll very easily mold or get mildew on them. So you want to make sure they get dried out before you try storing them for winter. And when completely dry, when you dig these up, it's kind of interesting. Under, underneath each one of the corms is going to be this dried, shriveled up thing. That was the original corm that you planted. That was the original gladiola. So you just pop it off and throw it away. And now you have a brand new one for next year. So how do we store them? Easy ways is put them in a put them in get a cardboard box, make a single layer of them, put in a layer of, of newspaper. Okay, uh, you can store them in screens or onion bags, just something that they. What you want to do is make sure the air can circulate around them. Okay, uh, you can use a breathable bag, paper bag, cloth bag. Nylon pantyhose to me were invented for gardeners because they're a great thing to store onions in and bulbs in and all that kind of stuff. Because they'll go stack in one at a time, you tie a knot at the top, and you can hang them up. And the air can circulate around them, and they'll dry really well. Okay. The main thing is is make sure you don't put them someplace that's going to be stagnant. 
you want air to kind of circulate around those corms. Again, you don't want moisture or mold or something to grow on these. Dahlias, they'll, they'll, they'll die off with first frost, which we haven't had yet. We've gotten close, but not yet. So when, when it blackens the foliage, the, the first frost, cut them off about two to four inches above the ground. Again, very carefully dig the tubers up. Now, if you remember from that picture, these tubers are connected one to the other by a very thin, almost stem-like thing. You want to try to keep them, you, you got to be a little careful with these things. They're tender. So you want to be careful not to damage them, break them. And again, allow the tubers to, to dry in a frost-free location. That's not a garage, okay? If you try to dry these things out in a garage, probably what's going to happen, if your luck's like mine, about halfway through the process, it's going to drop to about 30 degrees. And it will be 30 degrees in that garage. And chances are, whatever you got in there drying out, isn't going to make it. Okay, don't freeze. So, frost free location, I'd direct sunlight. Basement's a great place to put them back in the corner someplace. You don't want light on them because you don't want them to start sprouting. Again, how do you store them for winter? Again, the, the, the main thing is, is get them in a dark place where it's cool. You put them in cardboard boxes. Some people put them in plastic bins. I've known a lot of people plant them in peat moss. They're not really planting them, they're just laying them in it. And one nice thing about that is it protects them. You know, if, if you put them just in a cardboard box and, and you're down in the basement in the middle of February looking for something and you forget what's in that cardboard box and you start kicking it around or gets cat knocks it off, off a shelf or something, these tubers are fragile enough that it can damage them. So you want to be a little careful. But if they're packed in peat moss, it, they're usually a little more protected. Cannas are interesting. I try to save mine from year to year. And when we get to that part, I'll tell you what not to do because it's what I've done. Let the frost again, knock them off. You'll know. Leaves. One way to tell if you got a frost today, go out and look at your cannas. If those leaves are all hanging down and they're black, you got a you got a frost. They're very susceptible to cold temperatures. So you want to cut them off about four inches above the ground. I use a corn knife or a machete because the stock on a good healthy canna is anywhere from one to two inches in diameter. That's a pretty good size. So be a little careful, but that's what I used to cut them off with. Use a garden or digging fork and gently lift up all those rhizomes like we showed there at the beginning. When you first plant a canna, it's probably three, four inches long when you put in the ground. So when you dig up this fall, it's gonna be about eight inches in diameter. They'll grow that much. And so you know, be careful with them. That's why a lot of times instead of, if you know people that garden a lot, it's a, one way to get cannas is paying cannas. Yeah, how many you want. And they usually are referring to sacrals, not a rhizome, because you end up with so many of them. But it's a good way to, to, to trade and get cannas. You want to gently separate the rhizome, so don't break off, but it, it's no big deal. Gently brush the dirt off. Don't wash them. But like everything, there's an exception. Canna is something that can grow in the water. I have one growing in a pond. And we have a small fish pond in our backyard. We don't have fish in it because of raccoons. But I have a canna in, in a pot, OK? And so that one, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to wash it off because it's you know, been in pond water all summer. So it's a little, I dig it up, I'll know it because it's going to kind of be odoriferous. Or if you plant them in the ground in like a boggy area, you get that muck in it, wash that off because that can cause the, the Rise on the rot. Wash it off and then dry it well, well before you before you store it. But if you go over to uh, like Lawrence and Gardens and go to the conservatory, they have cannons there about six foot tall, and they're growing in their ponds in the conservatory in pots. It's one of the few plants that can that'll do that. Store them. The traditional method is placing them in containers filled with dampened peat moss and, and all this. I lean more towards the middle one 
simply throw them in a black plastic garbage sack, okay? And then close the bag. The plastic bag will keep the humidity up in there and that's what you want. Don't do like I did one year, couldn't find, got lazy and I put them in a paper bag, not thinking, and I had no cans for the next year. They were all dried up, all curled up. You get, they've got to have that moisture in there to keep that rhizome. Now you're gonna lose some over the winter, don't get me wrong. They're, they're gonna dry out and if they do, you, you just check them. Or sometimes you know, half of it's dried out, the other half isn't. You know, take potluck, stick it in the ground. It may come up, may not. But that's the biggest thing. Like I said, I just use black plastic bags now. It's the best thing to store them in. Keep them in a, in a cool place, you know, it's about 55. I keep them in my basement back in a corner where one thing, I know they're not going to get kicked if I'm looking for something. Uh, and it's above freezing. And you also want to, like in a basement, the temperatures inside your house aren't going to fluctuate. <clears throat> Some people put them in like a, they see like a heated garage. A lot of heated garages, they're heated, but the temperature fluctuates a lot over winter. In other words, it's made just to keep it warm enough so your car starts. So some days it may be 55 degrees, some other days it may be 39 degrees. And then it goes back up to 40 degrees or 50 degrees. That's very hard on, on the rhizomes. It can almost force them in to start growing again. You don't want that. Roses, there is a gazillion ways if you go out online and look of how to protect roses for the winter. Okay. The main thing that you want to do with a rose bush is to keep it frozen. That's the idea in the wintertime. Because if it goes through freeze thaw cycles, that's what kills the rose bush. It's not the 20 below zero. It's the January thaw is what kills the rose bush because all of a sudden get, the ground warms up, it, it forces it in to start growing, then it gets cold again, it kills the roots. So the idea is whatever, however you want to do it, you want to keep the ground frozen. So, but one thing, whichever one you do, don't get carried away. Don't run out tomorrow and, oh, I got to cover up my roses. No, you don't. Don't cover them up too early. And this is kind of, wait until a hard killing frost has caused most of the leaves to fall. Hard killing frost is probably getting pretty close to 32 degrees, almost freezing. That's a hard frost. And that's what you, that's what you want to have happen. You want those leaves to fall off of that rose bush. And, then, and another thing they'll say, wait until the temperatures drop in the teens for several nights. That's going to be a while before I think it starts dropping in the teens at least for the next couple of days. After it does that, when you're getting ready to winter protect them, take a rake, clean all that plant debris out from around that rose bush. That debris will just breed diseases for the roses. It gives insects a place to hide and all that. So clear around the bottom of the rose bush. And contrary to what I was taught years ago, a lot of things now recommend do not prune the rose bush. Those you say, cut it off, six inches off the ground. Now they're saying, especially if they're real tall, like uh, climbing rose bushes, reduce the height a little bit, but tie the canes together. You don't want the wind in the wintertime whipping these back and forth. So tie them together. I've seen people take burlap and wrap around them and lightly tie it together and put a stake there. You just don't want the wind to bounce those canes back and forth because it, it can cause them to break. Wait till spring to do your pruning. Then you can take out the ones that didn't make it through the winter or the ones that have developed a disease over the winter. Those are the canes you want to, want to remove. Like I said, years ago, it was you cut them off six inches um, to the ground. The most common way now, to, and an easy way to protect your roses, go to like Menards or someplace, get you a couple of bags of compost, or if you've got a composter and you have compost, pile them onto it around the base of the rose bush. So it's about 10, 12 inches high. Just make a, a mound around it. You're going to bury it. 
And after the ground has froze, after that ground, that mound freezes, then take leaves or here they talk about evergreen boughs, peony bushes that you have cut off, work real good. I'm doing that, straw, whatever. Put that on top of the dirt. What you're trying to do is insulate that dirt so it stays frozen. Remember, we don't want it to thaw out till next year. So this is what you're going to have. You know, there's the soil. You can see leaves. There's, there's the rose bush. The canes are sticking up. It's not going to hurt me to get. You know, the, the, the rose goes dormant in the wintertime. It's not growing right now. But you want to keep it dormant. That's why you want it to freeze. Like I said, I used, uh, when I cut off my peony bushes, which is something else you cut down in the fall, that's what I lay over them, is, is peony bushes. What do we leave for later? It's not all work in your garden in the fall. If you have cone flowers or zinnias or other flowers that produce a seed head, don't cut them down, leave them. The birds love those seed heads. The American goldfinch, our state bird, loves cone flowers in the fall and winter. Those are seeds, that's what the birds eat. And it's not uncommon to see Goldfinches and other birds picking the seeds off those seed heads. Just leave them up. Now, you may say, yeah, my garden looks a little mm, tacky. I let it look a little tacky. Take care of Mother Nature. Okay? Take care of the birds. Flowering shrubs, butterfly bushes, okay? American Beauty bush, uh, perennial hibiscus, etc. Leave them up. Now, you Next spring, you're going to cut them back. But for now, leave them up. It provides protection for birds. They can get in between those branches and that with strong winter winds and that, and it protects the birds. Some shrubs, like uh, American Beauty Berry, the birds actually eat those, those berries. If you really want a shrub that's really pretty, uh, it produces fruit, American Beauty Berry does, so about the size of a beady, and they're purple, almost a neon purple. And mine are turning now. They're a really pretty shrub to have in the yard. And again, the birds eat these, you know, will eat the, the things off the Beauty Berry. And again, it gives them some place to hide. Also, I leave my clematis vines up. I do not cut them down yet because the they're growing on a trellis, right? So the birds can get inside of that and be protected, especially like if it's raining and you get those cold winter rains, they can get in there and, and be protected from, from winter. And then next spring, cut them down there. Okay, so yeah, you're postponing some of the work, but you're also helping mother nature out with the birds. <laughs> Moving from the, from the flower bed to the vegetable garden. Not all veg vegetable garden is digging up and throwing away. But start by cleaning up, remove the plant debris, break it out. I've done this with, with mine already. You want to remove that because that plant debris can harbor diseases, you know, uh, stem rot. Uh, but if you had a, we had a pepper plant that developed a, a virus. That, the, the stem just slowly had like black, it was like somebody taking a magic marker and draw lines on the, on the stock. And so all the peppers turned black. And it's, it was a virus, so it's gotta be thrown away. Don't compost that. A lot of the stuff in, the, in our vegetable garden, I do not compost because I may not know whether that, those specific plants maybe developed a disease or something. Um, I throw them away. Also, a lot of insects like to overwinter in leaves on the ground and this kind of thing. And so to reduce the insect pressure, maybe on your vegetable garden, that's another reason to clean these out. Another good thing to do with your vegetable garden this time of the year is, is either if you have compost or go buy some of Menards, spread a layer inch or two of compost over your vegetable garden. These micronutrients will help feed the soil bacteria, which you have to have in a garden for plants to grow good. And then after you do that, till the garden up. But don't rake it. 
just turn it over. And the reason being is then next spring, the soil is going to dry out a lot faster and it's going to warm up a lot faster than it would if it was nice and flat. Now, that's your vegetable garden. That is not a farm field where they do no-till plowing, uh, farming anymore. Uh, like my friends in Kansas, I told him that, and he says, I don't do anything to it, but they don't turn theirs over, but they do no-till farming. Till the, till the garden over. And I said, it'll help. The big thing is to get it to warm up in the spring. Strawberries are well adapted to survive the winter around here. The only thing you got you want to do is give them winter protection so that the crown of the strawberry doesn't die or get wet or rot. And the best way to do that is the mulch them. The strawberry plant itself goes dormant in the winter time. So the best mulch is clean wheat straw. You can get this at, at most nurseries and that. Uh, Will it be clean? That's, that's kind of a misnomer. If you've ever went by wheat fields, some of them are really clean. Some of them, you know, a few other things coming up in that field. And when they cut that wheat, everything gets cut. And so it's going to get bound up in the straw. The biggest thing though to look at, if you go to buy it at a nursery or someplace, a bale of straw, look at the bale and make sure it's dry. Turn it over. Make sure it hasn't gotten wet in and it's moldy or something. If you put that on the strawberry plants, it will kill them. It'll smother them. The straw should be weed free and dry. Again, don't use moldy moldy straw. Sometimes that's it's hard to tell. If you go to break when you go to break the bale apart, if you get in the middle and someone looks moldy, throw that away. Don't don't use it. Don't use grass clippings or leaves on strawberries. The reason being is they get wet and packed together and it'll smother the strawberry. That strawberry crown in that needs that air circulation. That's why they always recommend to use straw to get that air moving around that uh, crown. This is kind of what a strawberry bed looks like. Now, that's getting rid of what you want to, you know, as you grew this year. But you can also plant in the fall in a vegetable garden. This is the time of the year you plant garlic. This is a garlic ball, but inside of it, or the, or the cloves, you can break it open. And they should be planted, garlic should be planted this time of the year, actually a little later, about mid October to mid November. You want the ground cool, good and cool, to plant garlic. I never knew this till about three years ago that you planted garlic in, in the fall, not in the spring. You let it grow all winter. So here you see somebody you know, putting the bulb in, again, just like a tulip, pointed end up, flat end down. You want them about three, four inches deep, about four to six inches apart, okay? You can either put them in a roll like that, or uh, the big thing was the square foot garden where you plant by square. Just make sure you, know, you got about four inches between each one is what you're trying to do. Mulch it with about four to six inches of straw, just lay it on top. It will, in the spring, send up its shoot through that straw. And people have always asked, can I buy garlic in a store and plant it? Yes, you can. You can plant that garlic and it will grow. Unlike some things that, that go into a grocery store where they're treated, like some potatoes are to keep them from sprouting, garlic is not treated. So, you know, you can go and buy a bulb, uh, bulb of garlic, or if you buy some and you got some left over, go stick it in the ground. Pick a place in a flower bed. We did this a couple years ago. We planted it, of all places, my wife put them in between the irises. And <laughs> grew just fine. After all is said and done with your garden, you need to take care of your, your garden tools. And this is probably the last and least favorite thing that people want to do. But take the caked on dirt, remove it from the shovels and spades, your trowels and all that. Get it off. Use a putty knife, a wire brush or something. 
get that caked on mud off and then wash them with water so that they're clean. If it's a shovel or a spade that you use in digging, we suggest that you sharpen it. And you're not gonna sharpen it like a kitchen knife, but, but put the edge back on, on that shovel. Uh, a medium or fine file will work just fine. Then wipe the metal surfaces. Think have a rag that's just gotten like uh, three in one oil you put on it and get it oily. Or and you can use that to wipe the blade, uh, shovel with, or spray it with DW40, either or. Another method that I, that I saw used and done, I thought was kind of neat. They took a bucket and put sand in it. And then they took, they changed the oil like in their lawnmower, took the old oil and poured it in the sand and stirred it around. Then in the fall, what they did is they took the shovels and just up and down inside the bucket, it cleaned a lot of the dirt off, it polished the blade into a real fine layer of oil on the shovel. So that's uh, another way you can you can do your cleanup. Big thing is, you know, keep one, you don't want them to rust. If it has wooden handles, say the shovel does or something, check it, make sure, you know, they'll, they'll dry out, take some sandpaper, smooth them out. So they talk about uh, wiping with linseed oil, something to prevent it from drying out. Uh, I sometimes just get uh, like polyurethane varnish or something like that and just revarnish the, the handles. You want to keep them from drying out. They dry out, they'll crack and they'll break. Then hang them, store them in a dry location. Don't put them by the garage door when snow blows in. Drain water from your garden hoses. Maybe you forgot to do that. And to prevent them from kinking, they talk about put them on a hose reel or coil them up flat and store them flat. If you, you know, drape them over a fence or something, that can cause them to kink. Also remember, if you don't have frost-free faucets on your house, you're either going to have to insulate that faucet bib or go down in the basement and hopefully they put a shutoff valve. Otherwise, that, that pipe will freeze in the wintertime. Now, frost-free faucets in a house are about 18 inches long. It goes into the house. And that's where the end, of the end of the faucet is. That's where the shutoff is. So when you shut that off, there's about 18 inches, there's no water. So what else is going on in your garden? Anybody seen a lot of wasps around lately? Flying around? Those are the worker wasps. They could be yellow jackets, they could be paper wasps. Hard saying. Those are the worker wasps. They're just killing time now. You hate to put, I think it's Anthropomorphism, big 50 cent word for putting human traits to animals. That wasp is just waiting to die. That's all it's doing. They are not raising young anymore. That, that's over and done with. So these worker wasps really have nothing to do. So they're just not flying around, basically looking for carbohydrates. So if you got a pot can and set it down, a lot of times you'll see them around the pot can. My hummingbird feeder has them around it all the time because it's got you know, sugar water in it. There it is, that's the workers, they're waiting to die. Only the fertilized queens overwinter with wasps. And the way they do this is they get under like a loose bark of a tree, river birch. A lot of your river birches have the bark that kind of peels off. Great for overwintering female wasps. So they can get underneath that bark, they're protected from uh, freezing. Woodshake shingles was God's gift to the wasp world because they can crawl underneath them woodshake shingles and it doesn't matter how cold it gets outside, they live through it. <clears throat> An example of this was bought to me, Silver Dollar City down in Branson, Missouri. Every year had a tremendous wasp problem to the point where they had to shut their rides down. So I got to go to Silver Dollar City I was down there looking around and I told the guy, he says, the problem is, I went down there the following spring. I said, okay, here's your problem. If you've ever been to Silver Dollar City, they were made like old buildings and that, and these barn wood and wood shake shingles. And I said, man, you just 
she just built an old wearing place for every wasp in the state of Missouri. They went down and ripped one of the roofs off and a whole top of it was covered with fertilized wasp queens. Just sitting there, wings folded back along their sides, waiting for it to warm up. And so what do we do now? I said, well, I'd probably get rid of the wasp. Come spring, these females will come out. You can tell when they're starting to come out that they're pretty, you know, they don't fly around too good in that, but that's how wasps overwinter. Bees, on the other hand, the colony survives in the wintertime. And the way they do this, they survive inside the hive. They feed off of the honey and, and pollen that has been stored in the hive. And bees have a really unique feature or thing that they do in the wintertime when it gets cold. They form a ball inside that hive. The queen is in the center of that mass of bees. And the workers, as it gets cold, slowly work their way from the inside to the outside of that ball and then back to the inside. And by moving like that, they create friction, create heat, and the colony survives the wintertime. That's how they survive. The queen being in the center has the, the, the warmth from all the, all the worker bees. So kind of a cool way that Mother Nature has, has gotten honeybees to overwinter. Everybody's favorite beetle, <laughs> Japanese beetles, I mean, where are they now? Right now, well, any year but this year, I would say they're about six, eight inches in the ground. This year, because it's 90 some degrees outside, they're probably not that deep yet, but the, the larva, which looks like this, this grub shaped thing, is working its way down in the soil. That's how they overwinter. And so from now on, to try to, some people want to put granulars out, you know, well, I'll kill those larvae, they won't be around next year. Probably not going to work. They're going to be far enough down that that insecticide is probably never going to get down to them. But they work their way down in the soil and they'll go down 10, 12 inches, okay? Overwinter down there. Then as the ground warms up next spring, they slowly work their way back up. In about April, May, they're up around the root, roots of the grass. That's what they feed on. And come June, July, you got this really pretty beetle flying around your yard. I was a certified entomologist, so I think it's kind of a pretty beetle. Uh, some people have asked me, you know, will we ever get rid of them? I could probably count on one hand, maybe two, the number of Japanese beetles I had in my yard this year. That was it. I know other master gardeners that <laughs> were using a lot of four letter words, I think, for their garden in the Japanese beetle. Japanese beetle is a weird insect. They're getting into a cyclic type thing where one year there'll be a lot of them, next year there won't be hardly any at all. And so that's, that's kind of what you got to put up with. But like I said, I didn't even have to pull them off, off my butterfly bush, which is usually what they what they really got to. Uh, no, didn't bother my cannas this year. For years before, they chewed up my cannas and roses and that. I really had no, didn't have any damage done by Japanese beetle this year. Now watch, next year I'll have them coming out my ears. Multicolored Asian lady beetle. Okay. Now we're getting into what I did for 43 years. This is what it looks like. This is an insect that got kind of imported in this country. It's an invasive species. It is one of the lady beetles. So it feeds on aphids. Unfortunately, not the good kind of lady beetle to have. If you look at it, you know, some's got a lot of spots. Some don't have any spots. Some are light colored, some are dark colored. Okay. That's the multicolored Asian lady beetle. What they're starting to do now is collect on your house. On the south and west sides of the house, they're looking for a place to overwinter. When they get in your house, they'll do no damage. They won't hurt anything, except for the fact they're in your house, okay? Another one is the box elder bug. Same thing, southwest sides of the house. These things will start collecting on the outside of it. They're looking for a place to overwinter in the wall voids and attics, any place they can get where they can survive the winter. And sometimes you're thinking, man, where do these house flies come from? This may be in January sometime. You know, sitting watching TV and you're flicking flies away from your face while you're watching a football game. 
and it's a cluster, it probably could be a cluster fly. These came in during the fall. They're not feeding on anything. They're actually, depending on how you want to look at it, the cluster flies, some people consider them somewhat beneficial. They feed on earthworms. The, the maggot or larvae of a cluster fly actually feeds on earthworms. She lays her eggs in the soil, they hatch, they burrow down, find an earthworm, and that's what they feed on. So what do we do about these? Best thing to do is use barriers. You, you will see some people will, will spray in that. I worked in that industry for a long time. Um, yeah, it's it's got limited use sprays do. Does a, helps a little bit. So build them out is what you want to try to do. If they don't get in, then you don't have to worry about it. Seal any openings around the windows, look for cracks around dryer vents, gaps in the siding, etc. When you go to seal these, I'd recommend you get a silicone base, either caulk or sealant. And the reason I recommend that, that's the kind that stays relatively soft. So as, as the house expands and contracts, even in the wintertime it will, this won't dry out and pull away. And if it pulls away, it makes a crack, you just got another opening for something to get in. So the silicones will, will give, and so they'll usually stay sealed. And it's just a matter of walking around your house trying to find out where all these are at. Then check the attic. You want to look at the attic vents and the soffit vents. These should all be screened in your house. Now, for me to do that, I got to find somebody to go up in the attic because my wife, there's no way she's going to let me crawl up in our attic. Not now. But anyway, they should all be screened. And what you want to do is make sure the screens are intact. In, in, in whole. Another reason to make sure these are screened, keeps the bats out of the attic too. Uh, just make sure they're secure. Mice. I bought this up because of sitting in my backyard. What we do, we have a cat. He likes to be outside, but we don't want to let him run. So we bought a dog crate bin, those wire ones. Yay, big. We put that down, we bring him out. He goes inside there with a blanket and water and he lays there and watches the birds and everything. Last few days, he's been going nuts in the backyard. I couldn't figure out why. Mice are running around in my backyard. 42 years I've worked at that. They're probably coming back to seek vengeance or something. But the mice are out now, okay? One, two kinds, one is the house mouse, okay? Common one you find in your house. There's also around here a mouse called a deer mouse. That's the one if you've watched Bambi, got a pretty cute little mouse in brown fur, white belly, transmits hantavirus. It, so either one of them will come in your house. What you want to do is, is now is the time to check your house, make sure it's mouse proof. A mouse will squeeze through any opening a quarter of an inch or larger. And the best way to figure that out Take a pin, okay? If I can slide this under a door, I used to inspect food plants. That was part of my job. And people would look at me, you know, I'm walking around their doors and I'm on my hands and knees. And if I could stick this underneath the door, I knew a mouse was gonna get in that building. Same way with your house. They can get in something that small, okay? So you wanna make sure the door sweeps are intact. Check the corners at the end of the door. Now, sometimes the sweep is there, but it'll crack, or sometimes those get tore, and that's where the mouse will duck in. Now, the mouse is not sitting out in my yard or your yard thinking, it's going to get cold. I got to get in Earl's house where it's warm. Mouse is just opportunistic. He's running along, and when there's a hole or an opening, a mouse just ducks in it because it's a harborage. That's their instinct. They're so low on the food chain, just about everything eats them, you know, mice. So that's a defense mechanism. So same way with your house. If they're running along on your porch at night and there's, it feels the, the warm air or there's a hole there, that mouse is gonna duck in it. Once in, he stays in, or she stays in, which is usually my luck. Look around utility and uh, entrance points. Good thing that, that we noticed in, in when I was in the industry, outdoor air conditioning with a comp compressor and all those lines come into your house. 
check around those. When they first put those in, they were sealed real tight. They were also insulated with probably foam rubber. Check that to make sure it hasn't dried out. Look at it, make sure that's sealed around there. Now, unlike insects, mice, you're gonna have to seal them out with like metal flashing, something like that. You put caulk in there, they'll just chew right through it. Now, one thing that I've seen people do, and I, I've recommended people do this, take steel wool, or better yet, copper wool, if you can find it, because it won't rust, stuff that in, then just put a thin layer of like silicone caulk around it to smooth it out so it looks nice. The mouse will start chewing in, but when he gets to that steel wool or that copper wool, he'll stop, he'll stop chewing on it. It won't chew his way the rest of the way into the house. Okay? But it is that time of the year you know, when mice are looking for a place and stay warm. Last but not least, when you're working in your garden this, this fall, whatever you're doing, don't forget to stop and more or less enjoy fall. It's to me the most beautiful time of the year around here. The weather's nice. Hopefully we'll have what everybody calls Indian summer. That's usually after we get a frost, kills most of the insects, uh, mainly the mosquitoes and uh, sit outside and be warm. Enjoy fall. It's Mother Nature's you know, painting show. So enjoy the fall. With that, I thank you for being here. And if anybody's got any questions, I'd be more glad to try to answer them. Yes? I have seen garden on the balcony. Pardon? I garden on my balcony. Okay. Yeah, so it's all Okay, question is, somebody gardens on, on a balcony, can you plant bulbs in a container and overrun them outside? The bigger the container, the better. If it's a small pot, probably not. Probably not going to make it. But understand, you're only planting bulbs six inches deep. Cross level in this part of the country is figured, does anybody know what it is? It's 42 inches. That's how far down they figure frost goes in this part of the world. So, yeah, but what I would, here's the problem with them in a pot. The ones in the center will make it, probably. The ones out towards the edge, a lot of times won't. So, one thing I've heard people trying to do is try to insulate that outside, wrap newspaper or something like that around. Try insulating it, bubble wrap, something like that. Just try to insulate it. Or try to get a big enough pot where you got maybe two inches between where that bulb is and the outside of the pot. Do you, do you recommend a certain uh, diameter flower that I could use in pots on the balcony that looks like perennials? I really like my perennials. What I recommend, if I'm going to try growing in, in containers and that, I'd look for native perennials that are around here because they're they're attuned, so to speak, to our weather conditions. What kind of uh, native native plants like uh, cone flowers grow naturally around here. So they'll they'll grow in a container. Uh, again the biggest problem is depends on how cold it gets in, in who knows. But I have known people that I've known people that take all their pots and shove them together, maybe next to the house. They will get a little bit of warmth off of it. Try it that way. Uh, bulbs could probably make it. Um, the problem with some perennials, growing them in containers, is a lot of perennials get a very extensive root system and a very deep root system. And so they have a tendency. <laughs> To go out the bottom of the pot. Okay, so if you try to grow them, put a saucer underneath of it. Mint is probably the worst one. Plant mint in a pot, and you will have mint all over your yard in two years. It'll be everywhere, but probably in that pot. Yeah. Uh, is this size. pardon? Size. I'm sorry. Chai. Size of pot? No. Oh. Chai. Chai? Oh, don't make it. This is a good time here to divide chives. We, we have a chive plant that's been moved 
probably six times because we move it and then we decide to plant something a year later and the chives in the way. So we dig it up and throw it in the ground someplace out and it comes back up. It's some of it's now growing down in Republic, Kansas. It's a friend's farm down there. Chives would probably would be one of the friend, uh, herbs that would make it through the winter. Um, oregano mite, thyme mite. Again, try to keep it in the center of a pot. You know, and have that insulated soil. And, and remember, most pots taper towards the bottom. So if you could find something, say that was straight up and down, it would probably be even better. Okay. And you could try it like wrapping it on paper, and I won't guarantee it'll work. But you've got nothing to lose but some newspapers. Okay. You know, that's the fun part of gardening to me, is, is to try something. Hostas, which you can plant them in a pot, and the way to get them to overwinter in a pot is about burying them in your yard. Where I bury ours in the vegetable garden. We have, we bought, they're called mouse ear hostas. Little dinky thing. They're a little big around about that high. Okay, this fall, they will be buried in a vegetable garden, pot and all. Dig a hole, put it in, throw dirt over it. Next spring, I'll dig it back up and it'll be just fine. So, but I know you can do even full size hostas that way until they outgrow the pot. Then you got to put them in a bigger pot. But that's one way to do it. Some things you can overwinter if you have a detached garage. Some things will overwinter in a garage. You got to kind of, you know, some of this play it by ear. Yeah, I, I have a northwest city. city I yeah, there's a worst case scenario, but not many. Uh, <laughs> on the north, our house, the back of our house faces the north, which I wish faced south. But it doesn't. But what we did last year, we we shoved everything up against the back north side of the house, threw tarps over it, and we had several several of the pots made it through the winter. They really did. Yes. Okay. I love squash, and I grow buttercups, uh, winter squash. Uh huh. And every year I have lost most of my squash. Just squash bugs. Yeah. This year, I think I conquered it because all summer long I checked the back of every single leaf, and anytime I found eggs, I threw them tore the leaf off and threw them away. Yep. But is that a bug that does that wintering like you talked about with Squ squash the, bugs? Will they do? Yeah, they'll overwinter in your house. They they bury down in the ground, or they go in under the cover of the boards. Squash, um, it's been 11 years, so I got to think. Um, squash bugs overwinter, I think, in the egg stage, if I remember right, unless they can get inside a building. And they'll overwinter in the building, come out in the spring, mate, and start to cycle all over again. One of the big problems to me is there's so much squash bugs growing squash. Is the squash vine bore? That'll, I mean, one day you'll go out and your squash will look just fine. Go out the next day and all the leaves are wilted. Look at look at the vine, look at the stalk, and you'll probably start seeing like frass. Mm -hmm. Inside that stem is the larva of squash vine borer, which looks like a moth. Now, the thing that I do, there's two things you at the beginning, once they start growing, you can use seven and, and dust that on, on the vines. If you do get squash vine borer and put the seven on, take the vine that's not infested and cover it with dirt. A lot of times it'll root. And so it'll keep, you know, it'll keep growing. Problem I have right now is we have acorn squash, winter squash. And squirrels just think that's a big walnut, I guess, because I got all kinds of bite marks in our, our acorn squash. Yeah. I like wildlife. It just seems like sometimes my backyard becomes preserved sometimes. Uh, but that's that's mother nature. And, and the deer. In the, in the deer, yes. One thing. Uh, another question? Yes. Okay, she asked why 
her carrots instead of being long and skinny or fat and squished, right? It can be one of two reasons. One, it's the type of carrot that got planted. There is a, a type of carrot that grows like that. And that's all the bigger they get with a bigger, bigger round. The other thing can be the dirt they're planted in is too hard. And so they can't, they can't get down. It could be. Okay. If it's a raised bed and it's one you haven't walked in, my guess is it's the carrot, it's the variety of the carrot that did it. Now it could be too, it could be a disease that's causing bad, but if the carrot looks just fine, but it, it's just. Okay, one thing, one thing, you plant the same place all the time? Don't. No. Always move stuff around in the garden. If you if you have raised beds, we have three three raised beds in our yard. One of them's got iris in it, so we won't count it. The other two is what we've had vegetables in. Move even carrots. Don't plant them the same place every year. Move it to the other side of the bed or into another bed or someplace. Move the crops around because if something gets into that, say it is a virus that's causing that in your, your carrot, it'll stay in that soil. And every year it will, and it will infect those carrots. So uh, either put them in, make another raised bed, you know, put them in that, move them clear to the other end of the raised bed and see if that doesn't help. Try that, okay? Yes? Growing garlic. Is there anything else you can grow this time of year that you can plant that makes over the winter? Yeah, over winter. In a vegetable garden, not that I know of. I think garlic is the only thing. I do know um, carrots, you can leave in a garden all winter. And you can leave uh, parsnips. In, in fact, most people recommend you leave parsnips in the garden all winter. And when you want one, go out and move snow and dig them up because they will, they'll do just fine winter. Carrots will overwinter in, in frozen ground pretty decent. But garlic's about the only thing I know of that you can, that you would actually want to plant this time of the year. Any other questions? As warm as it is now, well, depending on how long it stays this warm, you might be able to get like a fast growing bees or something to grow in the soil. Huh? It you're playing roulette with the weather. But yeah. yeah. Sometimes, it, yeah. Uh, I've known people when in the August will go out and plant beans. They'll plant peas. Uh, I left a few of my little baby potatoes in the ground and they're shooting up. I yeah. Might get, we found where we missed some that, was, yes. that we didn't get dug up. Yes. Our, uh, we planted fingerling potatoes this year. My granddaughter saw purple potatoes. So she thought it would be neat if grandpa planted purple potatoes. So grandma and grandpa planted purple fingerling potatoes in the garden. They taste just like regular potatoes, except they're purple. Kind of neat. And uh, she couldn't decide what she wanted to eat it or not. She saw about purple potatoes, but. Um, we got a few coming up that we didn't get dug up, you know, and, and that'll happen with potatoes. Um, they probably will not make it through the winter. Yeah. You got another question? Go ahead. I wish I could answer that because mine never grew either. I tried for three years to grow blueberries. One of the things with blueberry bushes, they take acidic soil, which is not in this part of the country. You get up north, it's acidic. Uh, my understanding is, and you could try this, they make blueberries now that are made to be grown in containers, in pots, and you can buy specific soil for blueberries, which is acidic. And that's what you want to plant that blueberry in. But if you just take it and plant it in the ground around here, it, it won't grow. If it does grow, it'll never produce blueberries. Our pH, our soil is, is too basic. It's got to be acidic soil. And it's really tough to acidify soil around here. You can do it with lime, I mean, um, sulfur, but it's pretty tough. Some of the soil around here is pretty alkaline. Man, it's farm garden, grew blueberries a while back. 
five years to get us going. And finally, we got going, and it was so much like Christian Stalin. It wasn't doing too well, people would buy it, but he said it's very difficult to grow these areas. Yeah, brown hair, they're, they're tough to grow around this part of the country. And I think if, if I was going to try it again, I'd probably try five. There's two or three varieties now that are actually made, have been developed for container gardening for pots. I'd, I'd try it in that, get one of those. Um, look, in the, look in the seed catalogs when they come out. If you order one seed catalog, you'll get about 40. Uh, but then you know spring's coming when the seed catalogs start getting stuff in your mailbox. That's when I look at it. Any other questions? If not, one, two last things. Over there on the table, again, there's some look like little pots. Those are, are giveaways. What's in that are two milkweed seeds. And this is, as most of you know, or maybe don't know, this is what the monarch butterfly larvae is. The only thing it feeds on is milkweed. It's also the reason why birds don't eat monarchs because the milkweed basically makes the larvae poisonous. Here's some seeds. Okay, there's two in here. Now there's directions. These things have to be chilled in your refrigerator for about a month, probably. 30 to 60 days. 30 to 60 days. So you can put them in the refrigerator now. Think about it. These grow outside in this part of the country. Milkweed does. What's it do? Seed just falls on the ground and gets froze. So they have to have that winter chill to, to grow. So Take some, they're, they're over there. Also, uh, another thing that people like to do are make uh, for pollinators. There's some directions over there, how to make a bee hotel. And these are for the solitary bees, not honeybees. It's like leaf cutter bees, mason bees, and that are native bees. Honeybee is not a native to this country. Uh, but the, the, and actually our native bees, bumblebees and that are much better pollinators than honeybees are. And so there's a directions over there, how to make a, a bee hotel and tell you how to make one and how to try for it. Yes. We had a what I thought was a killer weed. Oh, oh killer. Yeah. 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 There's another kind that I can't think what kind of what it's called, but it's it's apparently not. It's not Berries in the dirt. Yeah. Cicada killer. Cicada killer. Cicada killer. Yeah. Our it's our largest wasp. If if you run into an entomologist, do not mention killer wasp. Killer hornets. <laughs> and, and unless you want to get in, in, incest the ire of an etymologist. That's the worst thing, but newspapers call it that. They're, you know, that's just their nature. The one of burrows in the ground around here is the cicada killer. It's our largest wasp, about an inch, inch and a half long. Uh, she digs a hole in the ground, normally in your flower beds or someplace where there's no grass. And if you got clay soils, they really love it. Mm -hmm. Hole will be about yay big around, about the size of a nickel. You see a drip kicked out. And it's interesting, what she does is the female flies up in a tree and stings a cicada. That's the thing making noise this time of the year. Grabs it, figuratively speaking, jumps out of the tree and glides towards that hole. Sometimes she makes it, sometimes she doesn't. Some of them are the blondes of the insect world because instead of just dragging it over and dragging down a hole, she'll climb back up in the tree with it and try again. Okay? <laughs> but anyway, she drags this down in a hole, lays an egg on it, seals off that chamber, and goes looking for another one. The egg hatches, that cicada is it's not dead, it's just it's been paralyzed by the sting, and that's what her larvae feed on. Now Oh yeah, it, it, it's interesting to watch them because everybody knows how big a cicada is. It's about the same size as a wasp. And so she latches onto it, and like I said, leaps from that tree and it's tough for her to fly with. Another interesting thing about that wasp is as with all stinging insects, only the female of the species has the stinger. But a male cicada killer is very territorial. And you have not lived or you've been out and have one bounce off your forehead, about an inch and a half size wasp hit you in the forehead. It happened to me. They don't have a stinger. They can't hurt you. But he's trying to get you away from his territory because it's very territorial. Uh, 
Cicada killer is, is a docile wasp. About the only way you can get stung is do one of two things that I do not recommend. One is pick one up, or two, step on that hole without shoes on. And she's in the hole and trying to get out. Well, this one's if it comes at you, it's probably it's male. Females will just they'll ignore you. Yeah. Bees and wasps are not very aggressive. Yellow jackets, the oddball, give or take with them, whether they're gonna be aggressive or not. It's just on on any given day, yellow jackets can be very aggressive. On other days, you can walk right up to the nest and they won't bother you. It's the only wasp I have ever been stung by is the yellow jacket. Okay. I Any other questions? <laughs> We're gonna lock the door. I don't have no. I don't have any further um, comments online to to ask and share you about. But I want to thank you for all this information that you gave us tonight, Earl. I've been taking notes, and I want to thank you all that are here in the room and or virtually from attending. For those of you that are watching this virtually or the recording of it afterwards. It, we will have some of these still available, I think, after this evening uh, for you to pick up at the reference desk at the library. So again, have a good night. Thank you all. I appreciate all the information. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it.